Novak Djokovic is showing encouraging signs. Alina Svitolina might be a factor again. Tanasi Kokonakis did something that he hasn't done since he was 19 years old. And finally, updates in the domestic violence indictment of Tiago Zybach Vilch, stuff that I wasn't able to discuss in yesterday's Tales from the Booth, in which I discussed his upset over Daniil Medvedev. So, this is day four of Tales to the Booth. I'm calling tennis matches throughout week one of Roland Garros for TC+. Plus. And as a result, the uh, content of my, or the format of my content is basically the matches that I get to call and the matches that I get to see. Uh, and just, I'm going to talk about those every single day. The sleep, man, is, has been tough. I, I totally hit a wall today. Uh, couldn't, couldn't stay up. Really fell, fell asleep for the Alcaraz match. Basically, my call time into the studio is 1 a.m. every day. 2 a.m. local time in California is 11 a.m. in Paris. I do the first two matches. Uh, it's it's a it's a rough kind of uh, sleep schedule management task, uh, but I'm I'm doing well, and uh, it's can't complain. Can't complain all in all. That's for sure. All right, let's start with Novak. He gets the night session, and he beats Martin Fucevic in straight sets. Felt to me like a, a classic big three match in terms of the ebbs and flows. How many times have we seen a guy come out and play unbelievably well in the first set or any set for that matter? Sometimes it's the second set. Like just really firing on all cylinders. And Martin Fucevic was in the first set. But when you do that and then you the set ends and, and you lost it, it can be pretty deflating, pretty demoralizing. We see it all the time, I think, in these big three matches. Sometimes you have one set where everything goes right, but if you lose that set, you can come crashing down pretty hard at the realization that even my best wasn't good enough. And that's kind of what Fucevic ran into here after the opening set, which uh, maybe if he was a little bit more clutch on the break points, he would have actually won the first set, but kept losing break points. It ended up going to a tie break. He was outplayed in the tie break, and... Novak ended up uh, coming away with the with the first set, uh, kind of struggling with the wind early on. I thought the wind calmed down a little bit in the second and the third set with help, which uh, helped Djokovic's quality of play. Djokovic was having some some footwork issues with the wind. Fucevic was pretty savvy using his slice and drop shots against the wind, and the ball was just dying in the court, you know. And Novak not really getting up to the ball too well. A lot of reaching, having a hit up, lifting the ball from a low contact point into the wind, uh, or sorry, with the wind. That's kind of tough. Fucevic using his backhand slice really well. And just, I was really surprised at how efficient Fucevic was with his skillful creativity, you know, offensively. Obviously, in these conditions, we've talked about how difficult it is to just hit winners from the back of the court. Fucevic did a pretty good job of just constructing points in creative ways. Again, using slice drop shots, volleys, and also moving the ball around really well. His backhand down the line success in the first set was way more than I'm accustomed to seeing from him. And his forehand, which at times can be good, at times can go off the rails. In the first set, it was really rock solid. So everything was going right for Fucevic. Uh, Novak was also having trouble with his footing, kind of slipping and sliding all over the court, didn't have traction, was upset with the court conditions. All of those things, and Novak still comes away with it, right? You know, great tie break by Djokovic. Two backhand down the line winners to start. 4-2 was really the dagger. One thing he was doing super well was defending when he was hitting uh, against the wind. And I thought in general he was better hitting against the wind than he was with the wind. Uh, it was so hard with his defense. He was putting a ton of air under the ball defensively, uh, knowing that the wind was going to knock the ball down. So his defensive lobs were incredible. If you look at the 4-2 point in the tie break, it, it looked like Djokovic was dead in the water. And he throws up this impeccable defensive lob. Fucevic misses an overhead. Or, or was it a forehand? Anyway, Fucevic misses the, the ball, and uh, Djokovic goes up 5-2, and that was it. 
So, look, Marton succeeded in making the first set super, super physical. Uh, that's what he kind of needed to do. That's his hope in winning. But the problem is to, to be able to maintain that and for that to pay off by the end of the match, you're going to need to play a high enough level to, you know, at least continue that and, and hit maybe the three and a half hour mark or something like that. Fucevic was never able to make that happen because he started getting dominated. So physicality was never going to be a factor in the outcome of the match. It just wasn't. He was too much outclassed for that to really play a role after the one and a half hour long, highly physical first set. That's just not the way the second and the third set went. I said before the match, I might have said this in the preview, that, you know, Marton did have a chance to be a difficult opponent, but only if Novak didn't have his weapons working. And Djokovic, especially starting in the second set when his footwork was better, and he was just finding a way to position his body in a way that allowed him to just be confident and, and swing out at the ball, uh, basically finding, finding his contact point much more often than he did in the first set. As soon as he did that, when it came to the pace on his forehand, the size of his forehand, the muscle on it, I thought he hit a lot of, you know, maybe the best forehands I've seen him hit since January. So that's a really good sign. It tells you that maybe he's found a solution for the elbow pain. And there was one thing that was pointed out on the broadcast. He's wearing something on his chest. I don't know what it is. Maybe we'll find out at some point. I think it's some kind of pain-killing remedy. I, I think it's safe to say. I mean, midway through the match, his physio came down court level, gave the ball kid a fresh one, so Novak got to switch out his thingy-majig and put a new thing on his chest. Look, no idea what that is. But if I were to guess, it's uh, it's something in the pain-killing realm. Serve stats weren't that good, but I think you have to consider the conditions. Uh, the other thing that I was thinking about while I was watching this match, uh, look, Novak's focus level, it's so different at majors. And I kept thinking about that. Even when he was struggling in the first set, but then the way he came out in the second set, the way he closed the second set and maintained the uh, a really high level, even by the time he was up four love and five love, uh, then he got the early break in the third set. I was just watching how he was going about his business. Every point meant so much to him. He was so locked in on every point. And I couldn't help but think, wow, you know, we talk about Novak physically peaking for majors, but his level of focus in these matches is just night and day from what we've saw for what we saw, you know, in the in the lead up events on clay. Night and day. All right, next I'll talk about uh, Alina Svitolina. She's kind of had a, uh, a reemergence here. That was the first match that I called uh, this morning on court Simon Mathieu. Uh, she drew Storm Hunter in the second round. Uh, Hunter is primarily a doubles player, world number five in doubles, plays with Elise Mertens. Uh, just won her first ever match at a major in the first round over Nuria Prizas Diaz. Svitolina coming off a title in Strasbourg, 17th of her career. It's a lot of titles. And a first-round win over Martina Trevisan, who made the semifinals last year in Paris, 6-2, 6-2. So on paper, I thought this was smooth sailing for Svitolina. I did not expect this to be a close match at all. But Storm Hunter won the first set. Svitolina came out a little bit sleepy, playing a bit safe. I don't think she was uh, accelerating as much as she needed to. And Hunter jumped all over her, you know, with really aggressive forehand play, hugging the baseline and especially timing the forehand down the line, uh, which was by far the biggest weapon for Storm Hunter, especially because Finalita wasn't really hitting her backhand down the line and was having a lot of depth issues on her backhand trade. Hunter was just taking advantage of that and just crushing down the line forehands. Look, I don't know. If uh, the Monfils match affected Svitolina, I'm glad I'm just getting a chance to to even mention it because, holy moly, welcome back, Gail Monfils. We missed you. What a display that was. That is entertainment at the very highest order. And I am so happy that Monfils was able to just feel that moment yet again of just a absolutely 
a magical performance and an incredible night of tennis on court, Philippe Chatrier. Anyway, obviously, uh, Svitolina said she was up in her hotel room, you know, screaming, uh, probably waking up all the neighbors uh, late at night watching Monfils. Did that drain her for like an 11 a.m. start where she kind of came out the gates just sleepwalking a little bit? Maybe. But the important thing is uh, Svitolina started accelerating a whole lot more. Her whole game got much more forceful. Hunter's forehand cooled off and... From down a set and a break, Svitolina won 11 out of the last 13 games and cruised to a three-set victory. Caroline Garcia for her in the next round. Garcia's been shaky, really start to finish in 2023. And, you know, in, in her opening two matches here in Paris. So 50-50 maybe for that match. Svitolina's only 28. She could absolutely go back to what she was. You know, former world number three. Had chances to to be number one. Was pretty close on a couple of occasions. Uh, I, I said the number of titles that she's won in her career. 17, that's outstanding. Kind of a crazy juxtaposition for her where, okay, you're 17 and three in your career in finals, but your record in major quarterfinals and major semifinals is really bad. So it's weird. It's like, are you a clutch player or are you the opposite of a clutch player? I don't know. Depends if it's a slam or if it's not a slam. I'm interested to see where she do, where she goes from here, though. Um, I've always kind of looked at her as just a slightly worse version of Simona Halep. You know, just a very complete all-around baseline game. You know, both wings, defense, offense, flat, heavy topspin. You know, just, just a very complete baseliner. All right, uh, Vavrinka Kokonakis, unfortunately, because the first match went uh, three sets and Vavrinka uh, Kokonakis uh, went five. I did not call that match start to finish. I do not really know what went down in the fifth set. What I can tell you is that coming into the match, the biggest thing that I was worried about for Stan was his gas tank. He was up two sets to love in the first round against Albert Ramos Vinolas. That ended up going five. And I just felt like that might cost him, you know, that that he let that match get get long and get complicated because I've I've been looking at the numbers for Vavrinka. Uh I see him in 2023. Now, after losing to Kokonakis, 13 and 11 is his overall record. Wanna know his record in first round matches? Eight and two. So we've seen Stan be so good in opening rounds and then the win percentage just plummets in the next two matches. And look at the clay court season. All three Masters 1000s, second round defeats, and Roland Garros now, second round defeat. By the way, I'm not really being critical of him because I don't really think his goal at this point in his career is to make deep runs at events. He's enjoying the process right now of, you know, Continuing to be on tour, play at a high level, play big stadiums, get big wins. And that's awesome. He should be enjoying it. So, you know, me saying that, like, Vavrinka is not really uh, holding up physically in tournaments. It's, you know, just keep in mind, it's it's not really critical, but it is a reflection of reality. The question coming in was, okay, Kokonakis, though, not much of a pedigree on clay, n nothing close to the pedigree of Vavrinka. So was Stan going to really be able to dominate this match? And for a while, he did dominate this match. Uh, Kokonakis, he was getting, you know, he was getting dominated from the baseline. You know, from neutral, he was, he was getting killed. And Vavrinka was winning all of his second serve points because he's pinpoint accurate. I don't know if I've ever really noticed this. Vavrinka's second serve, obviously for playing Tanasi, your goal is to make him hit a backhand. But Kokonakis is pretty active with his footwork. Like, he's not just going to accept a backhand. He's going to look for the runaround. And he's going to try to read to see if it's there. Stan was locating that second serve so well. The runaround was never there. He was making Kokonakis hit backhand returns, which was uh, one of the keys for Vavrinka. 
Uh, the other key, you know, was I thought he was just taking a lot, a lot of uh, advantage of Kokonakis getting out of position. Sometimes that was Vavrinka pulling Kokonakis out of position with like the angled backhands cross court, which Kokonakis is pretty uncomfortable hitting backhands from outside the single sideline. Other times it was Tanasi kind of getting himself out of position by running around his backhand, which he needs to do because his forehand is the better shot by miles. The problem is he's not like Tsitsipas where he can get himself out of position with the runarounds and then his movement is so good that he can kind of make up for it, make up the ground that he's lost. Whether Vavrinka goes down the line into the open court because Kokonakis hasn't fully recovered to the middle or back behind Tanasi because Tanasi is having to work harder to try to recover to the middle and his body weight isn't fully centered at the time he split steps. He's always kind of moving to his right. So, you know, it opens up kind of both corners and you felt like Vavrinka was kind of taking advantage of that and Stan's forehand was unbelievable, unplayable for a set and 4-3, up a break. And then out of nowhere, I mean, Vavrinka had barely won a point on return. Sorry, Kokonakis had barely won a point on return for a set and a half. Stands level through the roof. 4-3 game, unforced error, unforced error, unforced error, just like sloppy throwaway game. And now we're back on serve in the second set, and it's a match. It, it really turned very, very quickly. 5-6 game, Kokonakis, really good backhand game. And Vavrinka makes a super easy unforced error at Deuce and then misses a volley that... You can't miss that volley. Oh, it was so bad. It was so bad. He just needed to tap it over the net. Uh, any volley would have been good enough. The ball was coming slow. I cannot believe he missed the volley. I don't understand how he missed the volley. That was the second set. And then in the third set, Kokonakis' first serve took over. And look, that's going to happen. He's a good server. In these conditions, obviously, his first serve isn't quite as effective. But I think the biggest problem for Vavrinka in this match, albeit in the fifth set, just looking at the stats, maybe this wasn't as much of a problem. But I think the biggest problem in this match for Stan was his block return and his slice defense was super ineffective. It did not work at all. When you're returning against against Kokonakis, there are two things that, that you want to do. You either want to get it to his backhand, or if you go middle or if you go into the forehand, you at least want to rush him. And if you do one of those two things, you're safe. But if you're Vavrinka and you're blocking it, Kokonakis is exceptional from a low contact point. He is outstanding at creating his own pace. And Vavrinka, off of his block return, was just getting put on the move he was having to defend. He was never starting from neutral. And he wasn't able to really work back into these points. He wasn't stealing the points. Uh, Kokonakis was just uh, kind of working Stan after hitting good, solid, assertive plus one forehands over and over again. Plus, Vavrinka slices a lot of his defense. Same thing. It's just not effective against Kokonakis at all. So that was a big problem. I also felt like Vavrinka's legs were starting to go on him in set three. It felt like his lower body wasn't really supporting his ground strokes quite as well as they were earlier in the match. But clearly he got a second wind, or at least I think he did. He won the fourth set. I don't know. I didn't call it. Uh, but Kokonakis wins. Takeaways from that for Tanasi. Uh, first time he's made the third round of a major since 2015. He was 19 years old. It was here at Roland Garros, which is interesting because his clay court record is pretty trash for his career. He's now 7-12, and 12, but now four of those seven wins have come at Roland Garros in 2015 and now here in 2023. So it's funny because I don't think clay is his best surface, although he does have a great forehand for clay. He's got a great clay forehand. But these have been his two best runs at majors. All in all, the big headliner here... I feel like this has been a long time coming for Kokonakis. I feel like he's played a lot of good tennis. And he's been healthy now two and a half years. 2021, all of last year, so far this year, knock on wood, that's enormous. 
great to see for Kokonakis. Okay. Uh, that's it for the kind of tennis portion of today's Tales from the Booth. But I do want to kind of go back to last uh, yesterday's topic, which was Tiago Zybach uh, Vilch. I mentioned the domestic violence thing, but I didn't really have any information. I now want to share the information that I have since attained and that has since been uh, reported. If you don't want to hear it, that's fine. I'm not making you hear it. Uh, but for me, it's pretty darn important that that I talk about this stuff um, and bring awareness to this stuff uh, because there there needs to be accountability publicly. Uh, and this needs to be be followed, and it should not be swept under the rug or ignored. That sends all the wrong messages. All right. Let me start with the press conference, because I hadn't seen it until after I made the video. Vilch was asked by German journalist uh, Yannick Schneider. He was asked, now the question was long. There are some ways where I thought Yannick could have worded things a little bit better. But essentially, the question was, what do you think is going to happen next? What do you think is going to happen next in your domestic violence case? That's the question, which is a fair question and a good question. Uh, and this was Vilch's answer. I'll quote him. I don't think it's a subject that we should be talking about right here. I don't think it's a question you should be making to anybody. And I don't think it comes to you to decide if it's a place to be spoken of or not. So let me translate that. How dare you for asking? That was Vilch's response to being asked about this ongoing domestic abuse case where he has been formally investigated and indicted by the police in Rio de Janeiro. It doesn't mean he's guilty. That's why there's a justice system. But this is a real thing going on here. This is a major story in 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 his in his life all right and he seems to be under the assertion under the impression that he has the right to deal with all of this privately because you know he says i don't think this is the time you know that you shouldn't be asking about this right here but essentially, I don't really believe that that's what he what he actually feels because a press conference is the only time where the media is in a formal position to ask you questions, to get information, to then transfer that information to the public. Uh, that's what press conferences are for. So when Vilch says, I don't think this is a subject that we should be talking about right here, I actually don't believe him. I think that what he really means is, I don't think that this is a subject that any of you should be talking about with me ever. And I'm only more confident in saying that and speculating that that's the case because Yannick Schneider was threatened by Vilch's agent after asking the question. And there is already a, a history of Vilch having very adversarial interactions with journalists who are trying to cover him as a public figure embroiled in a formal domestic violence suit. Look, it's very it's a very naive position for him to take. And by the way, he has every right in the world to not answer the question. In fact, I'm sure his lawyers would tell him, "Don't answer the question." And you know, that's a decision to be to to be made, I guess. What do you want to say publicly? What do you not want to say publicly? But if he gave that a no comment, if he gave that a next question or a, I prefer not to answer or or anything of that kind, yo, I have no problem with that. I get it. You have to listen to your lawyers. I get it. No problem. But for the response to be, how dare you for asking was shocking to me. And uh, it shows a sense of entitlement that, that again, I'm, I'm really taken aback by uh, because he seems to think that he should have the right to deal with this privately. Uh, but Becoming a public figure when you're a pro tennis player is part of the deal. It simply is part of the deal. And in beating Daniil Medvedev, he becomes a, a, a much more relevant, much more recognizable international figure. And that is why you are going to have media outlets following up 
on this particular storyline. He's not a victim for all of this. He still has his freedom. He still has his job. He still has a platform to argue on his behalf and clear his name. He has all of that and he should have all of that. What he doesn't have is privacy. He does not have privacy. You give that up when you get to hit a ball for a living, play tennis in front of millions of people. Hopefully, if you do well, make millions of dollars and become a public figure. And it doesn't matter, uh, you know, if it's not just for athletes. There are just many forms of life where you give up your right of privacy and that's part of the gig. That is part of the gig. All right. Uh, I also want to follow up on some information because there has been some reporting uh, from UOL, which is one of the largest media outlets in Brazil, if not the largest media outlet in Brazil. And I I am now armed with the information to kind of formally uh, explain what where the case is at right now. It's uh, It's interesting what's happened. All right. So uh, his ex-wife's name is, uh, I don't know how maybe you pronounce it, but I think it's Tyan Lima. Tyan Lima. Okay. Here's what has been reported. The case against Vilch has been stalled since April 2022 because the tennis player was not found on three occasions at different addresses he had provided to the Rio de Janeiro justice. Tiago's summons to the proceeding needs to be served personally due to the seriousness of the allegations. So basically, they have not been able to locate him, and that has delayed the case. Uh, but as a result, uh, the case is expected to have an update that will be formalized, formalized next month in June. In September 21, Vilch denied the allegations in an official statement and has not publicly commented on the case since the MP's accusation in Rio. That accusation being that basically he's running around kind of ducking the the uh, responsibilities uh, that he needs to fulfill in order for the trial to move forward. Uh, today, the tennis player's defense justified his absence by mentioning a busy schedule typical of a high-performance athlete. So that is the update on the case. All right. Uh, I do want to also provide the full breadth of details that are publicly available right now in this case. And I'll say before I get into this stuff, trigger warning, there's going to be some language, there's going to be uh, some graphic stuff, but again, this is me just acting as a relayer of information that uh, should be out there. And obviously, as I just said moments ago, Vilch has denied all of this. All right. Uh Recalling the case in August 21, Tyann reported having experienced an abusive relationship with Tiago Vilch. She claims to have discovered several infidelities by the athlete during their one-year relationship. She separated from him and had to go had to undergo psychiatric and psychological treatments. Quote, without me realizing it, he made me change everything in my life. I couldn't wear low-cut tops anymore. I couldn't even go to the beach to wear a bikini. I always had long nails, but he liked them short because he claimed long nails were, quote, slutty. If my political views were not the same as his, and they weren't, he would call me stupid and say that I should stick with the, quote, effing blacks I associated with. Tiago also made me take, my, take off my nose piercing and complained about my accent, saying that people from Rio talk like, quote, ghetto dwellers. Tyann said all of this at the time to UOL. So the Rio de Janeiro police began investigating tennis player Tiago Vilch for the crimes of psychological violence, slander, and bodily harm committed against Tyann. After the conclusion of this process, the athlete was indicted in October 2021. There is now more in the indictment. So here is what has been said as a result of the investigation. This is in the indictment. Uh... On May 8th, 2020, 
the defendant, Tiago, knowingly and willingly committed acts of violence against his former partner slash victim, Tyan Lima da Silva, by abruptly squeezing her finger. Um, in his actions, the defendant, taking advantage of the victim's financial dependence, humiliated and ridiculed his partner in front of family and friends, calling her incapable, crazy, trash, slut, and cheap whore. He monitored his partner's social media, determining which posts she could keep, bragged to his friends about constantly cheating on the victim, and detailed intimate acts of the couple, claiming that sex with his partner was insufficient. Um, I will end it there. So those are some of the details um, in this case. All right. So needed to get all that out there. And... Uh, I will be back tomorrow talking about tennis. Day five, second round action continuing. This has been Tales from the Booth. Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you next time.